I want to talk to you uh, to start off with, let me just move on. I want to talk to you about um, artists. I believe there are two types of very successful artists. Type number one are the innovators. This is a Jackson Pollock. It's actually upside down if you're paying attention. And um, you know, any of our kids at kindergarten can, can probably paint a picture like this without much thought. But Pollock was really the first one that took sort of splatter patterns to uh, the form of art and was actually relatively successful in selling his work. On a two-dimensional screen, it's not actually that entertaining. When you see these things live and you look at the layers of paint that have been built up through that process, they're actually quite, quite vibrant, quite interesting, quite, quite exciting. But a tremendously um, innovative start to a new generation of, of artwork. Salvador Dali. Um, again, there were some people you know, early on in, the, uh, in the, uh, the last century that were doing a little bit of surrealistic art, but he really took it to, to an art form um, and was tremendously successful, innovating new styles, new ways of, of telling stories. The other type of very successful artists are the expert practitioners, the people that are able to paint with light, that are able to take the story in their mind and expertly and accurately convey that on canvas uh, or in um, forms of sculpture, things like that. This is a, a J.M. Turner, um, you know, renowned for, again, his use of light and tremendous uh, expertise in, in delivering that story. The next picture is not one of my favorite, I must admit. Uh, this is uh, Thomas Kincaid. Um, and again, you may not particularly care for the subject matter, but I think you would agree that the level of detail, the level of expertise that's gone into this, this artwork um, is, is tremendous. So, so what? We've got practitioners, we've got innovators. The two things that they have in common in order for them to be successful is they start with a blank canvas. And I joined Time, gosh, about 19 months ago. And you know, the challenge I walked into coming out of high tech, 22 years in the Bay Area in the Valley, eight years up at Amazon, my first foray into a non-technology company, is how to bring together technology with other very creative disciplines, journalism, Photo photography, um, videography, storytelling, all of those creative types all start with, with a blank canvas. So do software engineers. When you sit down to write a piece of code, you start with a blank screen. And it is your expertise, your innovation, and also your practiced skills that turn out something, hopefully, wonderful that's going to enchant and engage and deliver on what your original objectives are being. So there's a lot of similarities between these two disciplines. And when I walked into time with about 92 brands around the world um, and a challenge that print is in decline and a company that makes a good portion of its revenue from selling ads in print magazines, if that's in decline, there's you know, you've got to look for a solution. Well, you know, what are the opportunities? And the growth of digital in terms of websites and mobile applications constituted that opportunity for us, the ability to take those stories that we've been telling through authorship, through journalism, through photography, and deliver those in websites, again, using ads, but also using subscriptions and other funding mechanisms, and deliver them through mobile applications, incredibly important. But how do you take a company that's been historically um, since 1922, not quite 100 years, but near as damn it. How do you take a company that's steeped in this history and this historic approach to storytelling and bring it very, very rapidly into the future, into, into the modern day? There's a lot of cultural elements, and that's what I'm going to talk about, is some of that cultural evolution. And I'm sure a lot of you work for high-tech companies. Uh, the people setting requirements are the same sort of people that are actually implementing those requirements. Those communications are very close and very effective. When I and my staff are dealing with people that are wonderful storytellers, but have trouble powering on their PC or their laptop in the morning, it's somewhat of a challenge to help them tell that story in new and unique ways. So 
I'm going to talk about um, requirements, uh, and I'm going to talk. I'm going to tell sort of two or three stories, just kind of to, to punctuate some of the challenges that I have. And although some of you are in high tech and working closely with other high tech individuals. I, uh, some of you will also be working in more traditional industries, or if you're not now, you may have the opportunity to do that at some point in, in your career. So let's talk about our requirements and the relationship of requirements from their originators. So I'm sure that a conversation between Michelangelo and Pope Julius II in the 1400s didn't go like this. Hey, uh, Mike, Angelo. Um, I'm the Pope, and I've got this great thing called the Sistine Chapel, and it's been hung with drapes for the last 40 or 50 years. It's a little bit boring, need you to spruce it up. Now, this is what I need you to do. I want you to go and get a bunch of plaster, I want you to color it with this big list of colors that I've got here, and by the way, I want you to buy the plaster from the guy down the street, and I want you to apply it in this particular and certain way, um, and then go build all these frescoes, paint all these frescoes, and, and deliver something wonderful for me. And Michelangelo, who is a, an innovator, but also an expert artist and practitioner, he was actually a sculptor by trade, but stepped up to this role. He didn't really have much choice because you know, the Pope who was you know, in charge could have you know, caused him some serious problems, um, kind of you know, would have to do as he was told, but wouldn't have the opportunity to use the skills, the practitioner, the, the innovation skills that, that he's really got. So I don't believe that conversation ever happened. I believe the conversation was more like Hey, Michelangelo, Sistine Chapel, six months, make it good or you don't get paid. I'm sure that was more of the conversation. And Michelangelo goes and uses and applies all of his skills to make this wonderful stuff happen. So the key message out of that is time after time after time, I'm presented by people saying, I want a button here. And the problem may be that, well, there's already a button down here that does the same thing. Or I think this should be a slider bar and I think things should be arranged on the screen this way. And they're delivering not a set of requirements, they're delivering instructions as to how effectively how to implement, which is bad if you have a group of innovators and expert software engineers that know how to take content and tell a story with it and deliver it in a very effective way to your customers. So telling people what you want, to, you want to achieve, where you want to take somebody's mind and where you want to move it to is really important without telling the engineers how exactly to go and do that. It should be a match of, of equals, of equal creative individuals, equal practitioners and experts necessary to, to achieve that goal. And it's been, you know, my experience all the way through my career, that's a very easy thing to do. When you're in industries um, that are not deep technology issues, I'm finding and have found over the last 19 months or so that it's a really, really hard thing to do. And educating people to define their requirements in terms of requirement as opposed to detailed instruction is, is a tough thing. So let's talk about internet, intercontinental ballistic missiles for a few minutes. Because why not? Um, ICBMs, in the, the 1950s around several the states, uh, mostly southern states in the United States, uh, there were a lot of missiles in silos pointing at cities in Russia, or the USSR. And those missiles are made out of steel. And steel is great because it is light, it has great structural integrity, it's a really good material for building ICBMs. The problem with ICBMs made out of steel is that steel rusts. And I would assert that a rusting intercontinental ballistic missile is probably not a very safe thing to have lying around. And certainly if you wind up firing it off and it gets a few miles away and develops a hole and comes crashing to the ground, that also would be a bad thing. So the US military in its infinite wisdom uh, contacted a number of companies, finally settled on a company down in Southern California in, in San Diego. And they went to this company and said, give us a compound, give us something that we can apply to these steel missiles to stop them rusting. And this company went away and worked on it and worked on it. They used an iterative development cycle, and they finally came up with a compound. It was the 40th attempt of a material they could apply to the missiles uh, to, keep them, uh, to keep them safe. And I'm sure you've heard of this material um, because it's called water displacement, for, water displacement 40, and we now know it as WD-40. And what happened is that the CEO of the company 
realized that he had a very limited market. There aren't that many ICBMs knocking around. So what else could he possibly do with this compound? And he'd realized that he had staff that were taking parts of this compound home and using it for oiling uh, door hinges or for loosening up bolts. And he realized that there was a, a longer, in fact, a bigger opportunity for this material. And of course, now, you know, WD-40 and all its iterations has become you know, incredibly uh, successful. We couldn't really do without it. So what's the point of all of this? W what happened was there was a particular requirement come up with something to protect ICBMs. And once that problem was solved, then serendipitously, other problems presented themselves where there was a built-in or a pre-established solution. The notion of scratching your own itch first, solving your own problems, but then looking for opportunities where you can double or even quadruple down on that which you have invented. So in the case of, of um, scratching our own itch, we had a challenge um, in terms of building uh, mobile applications. It was costing somewhere in the order of about $200,000 for each mobile app. Remember, we have 96 different brands. You can easily do the math. And each one was taking about six months to, to roll out. And it was a very inflexible architecture. And Time has you know, a good number of brands that are very successful, Sports Illustrated, People, Time, Fortune, Southern Living. Um, they're the really, they're the whales. But then there's a portfolio of a very long tail where there just isn't the money uh, to invest in building mobile applications. So our challenge was, how do we get this faster? Uh, we built our own platform. We didn't go out and license a third party because nobody quite had what we needed uh, for the type of, of application we're building, uh, streaming, uh, reading applications. We used a bunch of open source. We did license in a few components of third party technology. We, we built some of our own, and we built this platform called Toro. Um, it's a content streaming app. We don't even need to go to the editors or the journalists of any of our websites. We just cull the content, stream it out, and it gets presented. If you download the Time mobile app, you'll see an example of the Toro platform uh, in, um, in, in production. It now takes about a week to launch a new uh, native website uh, for Android, uh, iPhone. We even support it on, uh, on Windows mobile devices and a bunch of um, uh, set-top boxes as well. The cost tends to the floor. Okay, the sunk cost in building out the platform, but on a per implementation basis, the cost is effectively free, which is great when you've got this long tail of, of, um, of sites uh, or brands that you want to support. So we scratched our own itch, we solved our own problem. What we also found out post that was the world is full of small niche specialized publishing companies that are going through the same struggle that we're going through. Uh, print is declining, really got to move to mobile, really got to move to websites, but they didn't have the money or the technical infrastructure or expertise to build out those applications. So we were able to provide them the Toro application, allow them to very rapidly enter the mobile world, whereas you know, hitherto without this technology they wouldn't have been able to do so, and it's tuned explicitly to meet the needs of publishing organizations. And the benefit of delivering this at either cost or in some cases we, we licensed it at no cost is these companies syndicate our content and we will also syndicate their content. So keeping them, helping them stay in business is actually very valuable for, for our organization. When the Apple Watch came out, we used the emulator to develop the app for, for the Apple Watch. And the good thing or the bad thing maybe in this case that we found is that emulators in many cases don't. Um, so we'd... We finally got our, our physical watch on the Monday before launch and found that everything we developed on the emulator didn't quite work as we were told it was going to work on the, uh, on the actual watch. So over the space of the, the following weekend, we re-engineered. We basically rebuilt that application, but we could do so because we had a very powerful and broad platform that gave us the, the capacity, the capability to do that. So scratching your own itch, absolutely important, but then looking for opportunities um, without defocusing um, that you can use to go and help, help other people. So focus is, is incredibly important. Um, and you know, a couple of things that I'll tell my staff on a, on, a, on a very regular basis is do only that which is a key differentiator for your business and guard your time jealously. If somebody else can do it, if there's a third party, uh, a commodity um, shop that can do something better and cheaper than you can do it, let them do it. 
you should only do the things that are needle movers uh, for your business. You know, all engineers want to solve, want to solve every problem in the world. Um, keeping them rigorously focused on the things that are going to differentiate your business um, is incredibly important. So when I walked into Time in um, February of 2014, I found that we had five data centers. One of those data centers is on the 21st floor of the Time Life building at 50th and 6th uh, in New York City. This is some of the most expensive real estate on the planet and we were using it as a data center. And actually, I lie, it wasn't the data center was on the 21st floor, the 21st floor was the data center. I mean, just obscenely and stupidly expensive. I found out later why it came about. If I tell you that the building is 42 stories, and the data center is on the 21st floor, and the building was put together in um, uh, 1959, when telephone switchboards use the cables and plug and play, you can probably figure out why they chose the 21st floor, but it just evolved over time. So I walk into this and I see we've got tons of held capital in the data centers. I see that time to incremental traffic is about four months to go and, as Camille was talking about, procure the hardware, get it purchased, send it back because they send us the wrong thing, get it back again, uh, configure it, rack it, burn it in, it's about four months to go through that process. So any new opportunities that are very um, short in, in terms of temporal um, uh, opportunity, we, we just couldn't take advantage of. So um, I said to everybody, right, we're gonna move to the cloud. Um, I'd taken the Amazon websites and moved them onto AWS, so I knew it was a good thing to do. But I wanted to get out of being, being in the data center business. And at the time, time was spinning out from Time Warner. Um, and it gave me an opportunity to kind of write off our data center investment. I had one chance and one chance only to do that and move everything into the cloud. So I didn't pursue a, a hybrid cloud solution. I went straight to, to AWS. Um, and I kind of cheated. I told everybody we were going to move to the cloud to get out of the data centers just to reduce our cost and to accelerate our time to traffic. But what I knew is that once they got there, they'd realize that all of these, you know, the 200 or so services that Amazon offers, um, they'd start taking advantage for new application development and for re-engineering of existing applications. If I told them to move and re-engineer at the same time, heads would have exploded and it wouldn't have been a cool thing. So went through this, this entire process. Where we are now after about, um, I'd say about 15 months of, of doing this, all of our brands in the UK run on AWS. Um, 75, 76% of our brands in the US. And we built out effectively our virtual data center on AWS. So all of the tools that we're used to using are now available for deployment, rollback, um, all of the other capabilities that we, we need. Our hosting costs came down dramatically. Our time to traffic is now in the order of minutes. Um, all of our core critical applications are across on, on AWS. And anything that, again, is not a needle mover for us, get rid of it. Uh, we used to run our own uh, internal HR systems. We'd run our own financial systems. Nope, that goes out of the door. That becomes software as a service or product as a service. The only things that we will work on are the things that are absolutely going to make a difference to, to our business. And we hold that line very, very aggressively. Of course, the challenge is people that have been at the business for 25, 30, 35 years, it takes time to educate them as to why we're making some of these decisions. And the way to get past that is to show um, success in some limited area, uh, come up and demonstrate those best practices, and then everybody else wants to get on the bandwagon and show the same degree of success. So we find those one or two success points, you know, a thousand points of light, and, um, and then show everybody else and, and take it forward from there. I want to finish off just with a couple of other points about, um, about prioritization, again, about guarding your time jealously. When I started at Time, my uh, VP of InfoSec came in, He's kind of looking at me, trying to size me up. And he said, you know, what, uh, what do you think about security? And I said, it's my number one priority. Because, and he started to smile because InfoSec people never hear that. Um, it's always a, you know, second, they're always a second class citizen, invariably a second class citizen. I said, look, time trades based on trust and confidence. Say somebody hacked into the content management system for fortune.com and changed or embedded a story that said Apple buys Microsoft or something equally outlandish. Because people trust that which time says or fortune says, 
then we could move markets by posting an inappropriate or inaccurate story. So we've got to protect ourselves. Yes, we have to protect credit cards. Everybody understands that. But we have to protect that whole trust environment in which we operate. So security is number one. If you don't have security, you shouldn't be in business because your credit cards, if you're processing credit cards, will get taken away. If you've got other forms of content, uh, it'll get taken over. It'll get uh, vandalized. It, it's not a case of, of will it will happen, when it will happen, or if it'll happen. It's a case of when it will happen. So if you've got security, then you better be available. You know, if you're providing a service 24 by 7, if people become to you know, expect to, to have it there, then you better be available. So you need high security, you better be available. And then you better be fast, you better have low latency. Because if people are coming back on a regular basis and enjoying the experience that they get from your online properties, then you better be fast, otherwise they're going to go to somebody else that's doing it faster than, than you are. So security, availability, latency, then it's features, all the way down, it's turtles all the way down. But you've got to buy yourself the right to work on those features by handling those three things first. They're incredibly important. And I think the, the other sort of really key message is, as Camille said, test, test early, test often. <laughs> okay, all right, thank you very much, everybody. Can you stay on stage for a minute? That was great. That was great. What an incredible adventure you've had. So I have one question for you. Um, a lot of the people in the audience are driving big digital initiatives for their companies. And sometimes they're swimming against the tide of a culture. You rolled into Time Inc. You've got this big reputation as this technologist, disruptor. How do you handle the change management process? Is there, do you have a formula you can share? It I, I don't believe, well, first of all, I don't, I don't believe I have a formula. Okay. Um, how I approach it is, you know, there's, in any population, there's going to be some of the people at one end of the scale that will, that will get it. They'll be hungry for change. They will embrace it rapidly. There'll be the majority that want to say which way the wind is blowing, <laughs> and then there will always be the naysayers. Yeah. Um, doesn't matter. You could be offering them, you know, free $50 bills, and, and they'd still know <laughs> that it's not for them. So... You know, and it, you know, it's rather like um, you know, the crossing the chasm. You've got yes. to get those early adopters, uh, make them very, very successful, and show to the rest of the organization um, what they can do and how they can be successful. So a lot of the change they'll do is, is working with sort of closely held relationships and get them to go and drive the explanation about why people should be using technology. I'm a big fan of seductive adoption. I don't like to force technology on people. They'll resist it and they'll resent it. But the subductive adoption model is build things and they will come. Well, people won't come because they don't understand it and they don't get around it. But if they see colleagues getting excited and being more successful, driving in our business, driving more page views, yeah. driving more unique yeah. visitors, um, selling more ads or making more revenue from ads or getting more subscriptions to, to a site or properties, then they want to be on that boat as well but they will trust their colleagues who've got that longer term relationship before they'll trust anybody else. Not that they distrust us, we just haven't built up that good reputation with them, that takes time. So engaging with the folks that already have that trust relationship makes a significant difference. If I'm in your circle of trust, do I get an iWatch preloaded with time content? Could be. Could it's going to be within the circle of trust though, it's really important. <laughs> Colin, thank you so All much, right, that lovely. was wonderful. Yeah.